And uh, thank you everybody for uh, being with us today. My name is Donna Cooper. I'm the Executive Director of Public Citizens for Children and Youth. We are based here in Southeastern PA. We're joined today by superintendents across the Commonwealth for a very important conversation about some fundamental um, uh, challenges to how Pennsylvania funds schools that uh, pits school districts against each other and undermines school districts collectively. And our goal today is to make sure that the press and the public understand the deep rooted uh, systemic problems with how Pennsylvania funds schools and highlight the implication of those so we can have a more robust conversation about how to meet the educational needs of every student in the Commonwealth and not shortchange some schools to enable other schools to have opportunity either currently or going forward. Uh, we, Penn Public Citizens for Children and Youth, are active in the statewide coalition called PA Schools Work, and that campaign is really focused on helping lawmakers and the public make better decisions about how we fund our schools so that every student has an op uh, opportunity for a quality education, regardless of where they live. Today, we are talking about a report called uh, Hold Harmless, A Quarter Century of Inequity at the Heart of Pennsylvania's School Funding System. And um, here's what we want you to know about this report. First of all, uh, there is a link in the chat and on our Facebook page to the report right now, so you can see that. Um, but I wanna make sure that you recognize that the Hold Harmless Funding System is a, is a policy decision that is affirmatively made by the legislature every year and it has been affirmatively made every year for 25 for 24 years uh, from 1991 to 2016 and it is the basic decision that drives out um, more nearly six billion dollars of education aid to school districts across the commonwealth so to put it succinctly hold harmless has been the only consistent and significant school funding policy in place in the commonwealth since 1992 and it drives the 89% of the funds that are distributed to school districts. As a result, school districts that are um, low wealth, whether they are hold harmless districts or those that are growing and particularly those that are growing and are educating the poorest children have seen skyrocketing property taxes as a result of the education policy enacted and approved by the legislature every year to have money go to school districts regardless of the number of students they enroll. This policy has also undermined the ability for most black and Hispanic students in Pennsylvania to get a quality education. And it has undermined the ability for a quality education to be uh, delivered um, in school districts um, as they're trying to keep up with mandated cost growth. And mandated costs means pension increases that are mandated by the state, charter school payments that are mandated by the state and special ed payments that are required of our students and are mandated by the federal government. So we'll move to the next slide and say that what is Hold Harmless? First of all, Hold Harmless means no school district will get less money next year than they get this year, regardless of any change in student enrollment. So people are held harmless from declining student enrollment. As I said, from 1992 to 2016, this was the most powerful education policy system as affecting funding in Pennsylvania. Um, and, and in 2016, the legislature made a change and uh, began to say, okay, look, money's gonna have to follow where the kids are. And so, and it's gonna have to follow indicators of need such as poverty and local tax effort. But today, 89% of the state's funds go out in the funding system that's predicated on the hold harmless. And so if you go to the next slide, what we found by looking at student counts from 1992 to, to now, $590 million is going to school districts that aren't educating students for whom they're being paid. Now we'll talk later about why it does not make sense to take this money from those school districts, but it is very important to understand that nearly $600 million is paying for students that are no longer in their seats. Next slide. What that means is that you should understand the landscape of um, hold harmless districts. 63% of our districts have had declining enrollment since 1992. 
So declining enrollment is the norm in a majority of school districts. We'll talk about those school districts in a bit. So there is some rationality to saying, look, as they're losing kids, they still need to have educational quality. And PCCY fully supports that. The problem is that we have not also had a similar policy in place for growing school districts. In the case of the declining school districts, 167,000 fewer students are attending these districts than were attending in 1992. And overall, they have seen their enrollment decline by 22%, some by as much as 50, some by as much as 10, on average 22. And we are also often asked, where are these kids going? Well, as you'll see by the map of Pennsylvania that we'll come to shortly, um, parts of Pennsylvania are depopulating. People are choosing with their feet where they wanna raise children. And in many cases, in spite of the hold harmless, because our education funding system is so weak and antiquated, people are not choosing to raise families in these communities. Uh, if they can leave, they are. And the next slide. Um, hold Harmless has forced property taxes to go up in the poorest school districts where we've seen gr student growth since 1992 by hundred million dollars. That is an eye popping amount of tax burden increase, local property taxes hundred million dollars in the poorest school districts that have grown since 1992. This is a direct result of the hold harmless funding system. I'm going to introduce my colleague David Loeb who's going to walk through uh, some more key data points. We're going to then hear from three superintendents who are both from hold harmless districts and growing districts about the common cause of solving this problem that we share, and then we will take reporters' questions. So with that, I'll turn this over to David Loeb, who is PCCY's researcher and the author of the report we're discussing today. Thanks, Donna. Um, so, uh, so I'll give a little, uh, get to the data here from the report. Um, so when the state implemented Hold Harmless back in the early 90s, their approach was basically to say, okay, no district is going to get less money than it did uh, the year before. And in fact, everyone is going to get a small increase each year that's basically in proportion to what they're currently getting from the state. And over the years, that has heavily skewed the state funding system in favor of the shrinking districts. Um, these districts have gotten de facto per student funding increases just by virtue of the fact that they're losing students but not you know, keeping all the money. Um, and then on top of that, they got additional state funding increases. Uh, the growing districts, on the other hand, are basically in the reverse situation where they're, they're having to spread their dollars more thinly across more and more students, and they're not getting state funding increases that are in proportion to the amount of additional students they have to educate. Um, and so over, over time, this has resulted in a situation where the state funding per student has increased by more than three times as much at shrinking districts um, as it has at growing districts. Uh, and that's since 1994, which is the earliest year of funding data available. So here you can see the geographic breakdown of, of where these districts are located. Um, so this is a map of all of the districts in Pennsylvania and the red ones are losing students, they're shrinking, uh, and the green ones are growing. And you can see there's a very clear kind of demarcation point to where the, the east, southeast, and south central parts of the state are predominantly growing. And there's also a small cluster of uh, districts around Pittsburgh that are growing. And by and large, most of the rest of the state is uh, losing students. So because the growing districts are getting less state funding, they're having to raise their property taxes and other local taxes to very high levels in order to get the revenue that they need to fund their schools. Um, and this graph here shows uh, where districts fall when they're ranked based on their level of local taxes. And uh, you can see the green bars, which are the growing districts, are more heavily concentrated towards the top of the rankings, and the shrinking districts are more concentrated towards the bottom. And uh, you can see here that even though there are fewer growing districts in the state, they make up the majority of districts that fall in the top 20% um, in terms of their local tax burden. And the need for growing districts to have these very high local tax rates becomes especially clear 
when you look at the growth in state mandated costs, so as Donna mentioned, there are three costs in particular that are growing very rapidly. Uh, that's pensions, special education, and charter school payments. And it's really been a challenge for almost every district in the state to keep up with the growth in these costs, but it has been much harder for growing districts to do so. Um, and you can see here, this yellow bar is the growth in mandated costs, and the blue is the growth in state funding. And at the growing districts, the mandated costs have grown by about four times as much as state funding has. And that's since 2002, which is the earliest year of cost data available. And so these districts have to basically uh, come up with all of the money to fund this gap here uh, through either local tax increases or by, unfortunately, the only alternative is really making cuts in other areas of the budget. So even though growing districts are only about a third of districts statewide, they educate two thirds of the students in Pennsylvania. So this hold harmless funding system that we have is, is essentially a system where two thirds of the students in the state are foregoing resources so that the other third has what they need. And it, it's, it's just not a system that's working for the majority of students in the state. And the inequities become even more problematic when you consider the fact that 80% of students of color in Pennsylvania attend growing districts. So, you know, this whole harmless funding approach uh, is essentially systematically harming the vast majority of students of color in Pennsylvania. And on top of that, it's students in poverty that are really the hardest hit by the, uh, the disadvantages that, that growing districts face from hold harmless. Uh, because high poverty school districts are the most heavily reliant on state funding to fund their schools, it's the, the high poverty districts really bear the brunt of the fact that um, the state funding system is, is skewed against them. Uh, so this graph uses a figure called current expenditures for weighted no, students, the end of the day. which is, um, it's basically shows how much each district has to spend per student taking into account the needs of students. So for instance, it accounts for the number of students in poverty. And you can see here that the growing districts have about 2,000 less to spend per weighted student uh, than, the, than the shrinking high poverty districts. And that is a significant amount of money when it comes to educating students in poverty. Uh, you know, it, it adds up quickly when you consider, for instance, how many additional support staff you could hire with that money. So now that the state has an actual education funding formula uh, implemented in 2016, that you know drives a money out based on current enrollment levels and student and district needs you might think well okay so why don't we just take all the money that's still being distributed based on the hold harmless method and redistribute it through the funding formula the problem with that is it would take a lot of money away from shrinking districts uh, who truly do need that money and to understand this problem a bit better we need to kind of take a step back and consider this, this broader problem, which is that the state puts far too little money into the education system overall. Uh, Pennsylvania ranks 47th out of the 50 states when it comes to the share of education funding provided by the state. And so even though these, these shrinking districts that benefit from Hold Harmless are getting comparatively more state funding, it's not like, you know, they're not swimming in cash or anything like that. They, in fact, you know, many of them are, are kind of just barely scraping by themselves. And um, just some examples to illustrate that. So 78 uh, shrinking districts, about a quarter of them that would be hurt through a redistribution have very high poverty rates. Uh, at least 30 of them have very high local tax burden as it is. And even though the majority of students of color in the state attend growing districts, there's still one in five attending a district that would be hurt if we just redistributed the money. So, you know, our, our approach can't be, you know, to, to do another, another solution that would just harm one set of districts to help another. Uh, we really need to create a state funding system that works for all districts. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Donna to talk about uh, solutions to uh, achieve such a system. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, the conclusion of this report, given the compelling data that we found of the extraordinary needs of even the declining districts or the shrinking districts in Pennsylvania, suggests to us that we do need to leave the hold harmless system in place, that we need to rely on the school funding formula to distribute new funds 
but we need to add a new po uh, policy to the plate. So just as we've had a quarter of a century of the hold harmless policy, we need a quarter of a century of a new policy that remedies the needs of the growing districts uh, and does so in a way that does not disadvantage the, the shrinking districts. The first step of that is establishing adequacy targets. What does that mean? That means that we say, this is how much it takes to educate a child. And we make sure that we begin to front load money to districts that are the furthest away from their adequacy target. Pennsylvania did this in, 20, uh, in 2006. It was the policy in place from 20, 2006 to 2011. And it caused money to go specifically to growing districts that were high need, low wealth. Because even in growing districts, they are not all created equal. There are some very high wealth growing districts that do not need more state aid to compensate relative to the lower uh, wealth communities. So first an adequacy target would say, this is how much we need and begin to drive state funds to that. And then we would take a supplement of funding that says in addition to what states, the districts might receive in the basic ed funding formula to bring up the bottom districts, those that are particularly growing, we would drive additional money in <clears throat> so we could more rapidly close the gap and end the policy, the end the, the fact that we are the most disparate state in the country in terms of the difference in resources between the rich and poor. Those two strategies are the best way to conserve tax dollars and target money to just those districts that are growing and have high poverty and high tax effort. Um, and also even to those that are hold harmless that have a high tax effort and are, are, um, uh, are, are very low income and still aren't at an adequacy target. You could do that with the least amount of tax dollars compared to the third recommendation, which tends to be the moving narrative in Harrisburg, which is if we fund the formula, we will solve the legacy of the hold harmless. But it's important that people understand that would require $4.6 billion in new funding for schools. That would be a way to create a unified coalition because 500 school districts would receive the benefits of getting a $4.6 billion increase. But we believe there are other intermediate steps that could more rapidly resolve the problems of the poorest districts and those that are growing in a high tax effort by establishing the adequacy targets and putting a supplement in place. So before we take press questions, um, we have taken the liberty today to invite three superintendents who are in many ways, you know, the heroes in this COVID crisis. Uh, I don't think any Pennsylvania needs to be reminded how hard our school districts have worked and how hard our teachers have worked to continue to educate our children in these dark times and with such limited resources. Um, and we are grateful that the federal government has done several stimulus packages to support school districts. Um, and we are also grateful that the state did not cut money to schools, but there is a long way to go to help our school districts recover from uh, COVID and be able to be coming back roaring strong. Um, the three superintendents here today are from Greater Johnstown. Greater Johnstown, as you know, is out in Western PA and is a district that has been a beneficiary of the current Hold Harmless system. Uh, Superintendent Amy Arcurio. And then I'll introduce the other supers as we move along, but I'd like to give the floor to Superintendent Arcurio. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share our story from the Greater Johnstown School District. As you stated, we are a small city located in West Central Pennsylvania. We were once the hub for the steel and coal community, and or, excuse me, for the steel and coal industry, and jobs were once plentiful here. However, that is no longer the case. And when the jobs left, people left. Although Greater Johnstown has had declining enrollment, we are still far from having the level of resources that we need. We would be far better off if all funding was put through the formula and our students desperately need more teachers, updated textbooks, access to current technology that this funding would provide. But we also know that simply ending 
Hold Harmless doesn't give all children the resources that they need. So we need the state to grow the pie. Quite simply, the pie isn't big enough for all of us. And it would be so much better if we would all have access to the resources that we need instead of pitting one district's children against another district's. Our workforce in the Greater Johnstown School District has really been disseminated over the past 20 years. We currently have half the teachers that we need and what we had 20 years ago. Our enrollment decline hasn't happened to a degree where we can make less people in our school system cover all of the needs that our students have. We constantly ask our folks to do more and more and to increase their capacity. This doesn't come with additional dollars, supplemental pay or raises, but it's asking them to continuously do more and more as the needs of our students continue to increase. We are struggling just to stay afloat in addressing academics. The lack of resources that we have currently makes it impossible to address the social and emotional needs of our students. And as district leaders, we recognize that if we do not address the social, emotional, and behavioral needs of our students, we are far from able to begin to address the academic needs that they have. These continue to remain real barriers to students' proficiency in reaching those academic targets that we know the removal of those barriers would allow them to achieve. If the state were to fund our district adequately, we could hire more guidance counselors. We could hire more therapists. We could hire more school social workers. We could hire more behavior specialists people that we know would definitely make a difference to our students achieving the level of proficiency that we know they have the talent and the capabilities of achieving. We have very little capacity in Johnstown to raise money through our local taxes. As a district leader, I cannot ask my residents to pay any more than they're already paying. Most of our families are deep, deep census poor families, and they are struggling to just make ends meet. We have seen a lot of people leave our community and only the increase of taxes would just drive them quicker out of our community. We wanna make sure that we are not burdening our local residents with this responsibility. We need the state to step in and help ensure that we have the necessary dollars to educate our students. In fact, in Johnstown, we are in the top 100 for the level of tax burden compared to the resources available in our community. We believe that our school district is responsible to be one of the economic game changers for our community. We're not the steel town in the coal mining town of yesteryear. We are an urban community right on the fringe of reinventing ourselves. And as a district leader, I need to ensure our community that we are preparing our students to meet the workforce that is changing. We know our students will remain in Johnstown and make Johnstown a robust community that it once was. But we desperately need those resources to ensure the product that we are putting out into the community is ready to meet the challenges to renew the greater Johnstown city. The current system creates haves and have nots for us, but we have nots are held to the same standards that all of the districts around us who are adequately funded and have the resources they need to bring their children to proficiency. It's simply impossible for us to get there under the current system. In, we need to increase funding so that the state can ensure that all districts all of the Commonwealth's children have the resources they need to reach their full potential. The policy of Hold Harmless is not a viable school funding strategy, and we need to do better for all of Pennsylvania's children, not just the students in my community, but students throughout the Commonwealth. They need to make sure that their district has the resources 
to help them achieve the future that they dream to achieve, whether it be in a career or additional education in college or a technical or trade school. We need those resources to give our students that future that we all know they have. It's our responsibility to make sure the resources are there to support that future for them. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, I think it's fascinating to hear what it's like in Greater Johnstown in a district where you have seen so many people leave your community. And we're going to now go to the other side of the state and hear from uh, Dr. Mumin. Now, when I introduce Dr. Mumin, I do need to say to everybody gathered that he was selected as the Superintendent of the Year in Pennsylvania. And he is a finalist for the Superintendent of the Year nationally. And we will hear the fate of that in the middle of February. Um, and by the way, he is the Superintendent of the Year in one of the poorest growing districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the Reading School District. Um, and so Dr. Mumin, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are about how we're funding the schools. Well, thank you very much, Donna, for having me here today. And thank you so much for that warm introduction. Uh, I must say that um, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants here in Reading and uh, those accolades are, 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 much, are much a part of the type of work that's happening here in Reading, not only in the school district, but also in the community at large. Uh, so I, I stand here or I sit here red night proud. Um, in regards to Hold Harmless, um, we've grown over 50% uh, since the policy began. And that becomes extremely problematic because we have a very high poverty rate here in the city of Reading. Uh, our students are 99% underserved and we are 95% a minority district. What that means is that education is the prerequisite for our students to be able to get on that pathway in regards to the work, workforce development, uh, in regards to higher education, and more importantly, coming back hopefully and sustaining the local economy here in Reading, which is beginning to emerge. We found in this high poverty community, we have some gems. We have some things that are successes. And one of the successes is that here in this part of the state, we happen to still have jobs that are, that are available in the trades. Um, we have uh, jobs that are available in farming. And we also have a lot of entrepreneurial activities or, or, or um, uh, activities that can take place here in the city of Reading as the city is emerging. And with that said, one of the nuggets that is just phenomenal is that our community is a walk to work community, a very loyal walk to work community. So there are a lot of things in regards to the future of the city of Reading that plays hand in hand and coalesce with the school system. What I mean by, you know, looking at the 99% students that are underserved quite, quite clearly, and it has been spoken about earlier, is that we start to deal with the achievement gaps. And most recently, how the uh, digital divide has been perpetuated uh, in, in result of the pandemic. Um, very quickly, we had the opportunity with um, funding from the state, support from the federal government in regards to closing our digital divide. We had a three to five year technology plan to be able to have devices in the hands of all of our students. Uh, and then there was an extra layer there. We had to work on connectivity uh, to those devices for our students. A school district like ours, we had to pull this, this plan together, this three to five year plan. We pulled it together in three months. Now. That is something that is so positive because now we are starting to close the digital divide, but many of the funds to, to maintain that type of uh, educational approach uh, with strong teaching and pedagogy has to come from the general fund in, in regards to being sustainable, which is something that we are very laser focused on continuing. We're, you know, in here in the city of Reading, what's very unique is that, yes, we have a cadre of community members, um, passionate students, of course, excellent educators. And again, I stand on the shoulders of a great administrative team, but 
the city of Reading is one of the highest, highest tax burden cities in the state of Pennsylvania or in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I must say, I have to give um, accolades and lots of, um, lots of, uh, I had lots of admiration for Governor Wolf when Governor Wolf stepped forward after we came out of a historic budget impasse. And um, he, he came roaring out of that uh, budget impasse with a fair funding formula. Immediately, uh, I was extremely humbled and, and excited because the fair funding formula does recognize poverty rates. Uh, even takes a look at acute, uh, takes looks at acute poverty and examines acute poverty. Uh, it takes a look at students who receive services through our ESL or English language learner students. And here in the city of Reading or in the school district of Reading, um, that population of students for us is about 30%. And also takes a look at um, you know the academic uh, the academic resources and it was a great a great attempt the fair funding formula really helped to balance uh, some of the things that we were attempting to do in regards to pedagogy and instruction and resources the issue is we have to continue to advocate for new dollars going into that formula the formula is great but to hold harmless dollars again. Reading School District is the most underserved school district based on hold harmless dollars. Uh, it's been that way historically, it's that way to date. Um, in regards to the small increases in the formula, yes, they are magnificent. However, having the sustainability behind it with being able to bring the hold harmless dollars into the and feed the formula with the hold harmless dollars will really help to create more equity when it comes to educating students in high poverty areas. I say this often, you know, our educators are very special here in the city of Reading. It's a tough job. It's a tough job when you are that conduit, you are that beacon of hope to be able to move students from their current conditions in regards to poverty and say, there's a future out there where you can change your, you can change your conditions. You can play a huge and major part in this ever-changing society. But then when you look next to districts next door, you look across the state and you say, wait a minute, we're dealing with a funding formula where our students receive approximately $8,500 per pupil with additional services such as ES, ELL and additional services, of course, a special ed, which has some state and federal funding attached. But when we look at these parameters uh, and how we have to deal with $8,500 per pupil, while there are some of my colleagues who lead districts uh, in access of $24,000 per pupil, and these are districts that I'm talking about that I was an administrator in years ago, back in the, back in the early 2000s, and they were at $24,000 per pupil then. We are at $8,500 per pupil now. So when looking at the, the small increases, yes, they provide some quick acceleration in regards to catching up with resources. But as those dollars, again, are not uh, fully funded, you know, meaning that the that the hold harmless system is not funding uh, funding the um, uh, funding the educational system, the fair funding formula. The gap continues to perpetuate. We simply just need a policy to a policy of hold harmless that is viable for school funding strategy, and we just need to do better. I see the state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. What an Awesome, uh, awesome state in regards to we have everything here. You know, we have the big cities, we have the beautiful rural areas, we have the smaller cities like the city of Reading, and there is momentum. There's momentum that's starting to, to, to kick up and take place because the education system is able to stay, the education systems are able to stay viable and to stay competitive in regards to having our students prepared for, you know, this ever changing society. I just see that it is something that is embedded in hope where I talk to my administrators about this a lot. And hope is hope and health, uh, open advocacy, passionate action and empathy. Together, together with a more equitable fair funding formula, which takes into account, uh, takes into account the hold harmless dollars, we have the opportunity as a commonwealth, 
not simply by zip codes, right. as a commonwealth to be able to continue to move this educational energy forward. Thank you so much. Because the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is a beautiful Absolutely. place. So I thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Donna. Thank you. And I think one of the things you can see that in spite of extraordinary odds, our superintendents are hope and optimism, and they are the engine of economic growth in their community. Now, I'm going to wrap this up in terms of presentations with Superintendent Reese. And I had the terrific opportunity of meeting her in her school district in Potter County a little bit more than a year and a half ago. And like many of, I think all of you who are here as super started as a teacher and worked your way up the chain. And unlike Dr. Mumin didn't have the opportunity of going from a wealthy to a poor school district for that contrast, but stayed put in Austin area school district, which is a remarkable school district. Um, now, Austin Area School District is extraordinary because it has this incredible breadth of education for a unique school district. And superintendent's going to tell us about that because I think it really epitomizes what's possible in Pennsylvania when all school districts have the resources they need. Superintendent. Thank you, Donna. Um, I think we all see why Dr. Mamim is the superintendent of the year. He is a phenomenal speaker. <laughs> I could listen to him speak all day. Um, so like Donna said, I am uh, the superintendent in Austin, which is actually the smallest public school um, in Pennsylvania. We're located in Potter County, which is a very rural area. Um, my district covers 220 square miles. Um, if you, it could take you about an hour to drive from one end of the district to the other, and on your journey, you would not run into one single red light. Um, our district, as well as the other districts in IU-9, have experienced significant population decline. Our IU has averaged um, a consistent 1% decrease in population since the early 1970s. Austin does benefit from Hold Harmless, um, but we also have the highest millage rate in our county. Uh, if we raise one mil, it generates a little over $31,000 for our district. Um, Hold Harmless, along with some grant opportunities, has afforded us the ability to have access to resources that enable us to do some great things for our students. We're able to provide services along the entire educational spectrum. We offer a pre-K counts preschool program for four-year-olds, and we are a site for the Northern Pennsylvania Regional College, so we can offer cert certification and associate degree programs. Even with these resources that we have, we need to get creative and stretch our funding to meet the needs of all of our students. We work collaboratively with other school districts, IU-9, various county services, and the Potter County Education Council. Within our IU, we share special education services and provide fair share classrooms to offset some of those costs. Austin is the home to the high school emotional support program for a three county region. We contract mental health services um, through our county and we have a career mentor in our building that is part of a, a program with the Education Council. Many of our teachers um, have multiple certifications so we can provide our students with the mandated classes that they need and also provide some elective opportunities. We outsource most of our auxiliary programs such as our cafeteria, our maintenance, and our transportation. You know, as David pointed out, Pennsylvania ranks 47th out of 50 in the country for the share of funding that's provided by the state. The state really does need to increase the funding to all students in Pennsylvania to have access to high quality education. School district leaders are united in our view that the state needs the funding plan that works for all students. Students in Austin and the students in Reading should have access to the same resources. Eliminating Hold Harmless would be detrimental to Austin and to all the school districts with a declining population, but to continue with the current situation is not the answer. Of all the expenses and revenue our district cannot control, the most significant is state support for our students' education. Because of our high aid ratio, we truly are a state-supported district. We must continue to push for adequate support for public education in a fair and equitable manner. We need to adopt fair funding that not only supports Austin students appropriately, but all Pennsylvania students appropriately. Our constitution requires it and our students deserve it. Thank you, Superintendent. And just in conclusion, I wanna say that the, the single most powerful policy that's been in place, the hold harmless policy, has enabled this great superintendent 
to offer an extraordinary quality of education to her students. And uh, it would be um, immoral and unacceptable for Superintendent Reese to lose resources to help Superintendent Arcurio or Dr. Mumin in Reading and Greater Johnstown. What we are trying to point out here today is that we have a common problem among all 500 school districts in, the, in Pennsylvania. Those that do not have adequate funds need to have adequate funds. There is a way to make that happen by establishing an adequacy target, supplementing the aid, and making sure that we get districts that are underspending or don't have the resources they need because of their local tax effort and enable them to do that full sort of cradle to college approach that uh, is in place in the Austin area school district. It is truly a remarkable district. I wanna thank the superintendents who have been here. Um, I see that we have a question from uh, Miles uh, Ryan from uh, WHYY. So I'm gonna kick this off with his question and then I will invite the reporters who are on the line with us. You can unmute un uh, yourself and ask a question, but I'll start with yours, Miles. So in Reading, as you said, you're at about 8,500 and Greater Johnstown isn't much higher than that. You're pretty much in the same underfunded situation in spite of the state's funding policy on Hold Harmless. Um, can you describe to us the uh, way in which the COVID crisis has stretched your finances and exposed the vulnerabilities? And I know that superintendents always wanna make sure that their parents and their community have faith in what they're doing. Um, but I know that it is also important for our lawmakers to understand the real challenges that you faced in covering the cost of digital divide, whether it's the bandwidth, whether it's the training for teachers, whether it's the devices, how did you pay for that? What couldn't you do? And so I'll start with Dr. Mumin. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Brian, uh, for, for the question. Um, trust all as well. And uh, as I said earlier, one of the things that really popped out was the digital divide and the necessity to be able um, to, you know, to, to purchase technology devices. Um, as we know, technology devices have a very short shelf life. Uh, in regards to being updated, in regards to the, you know, damages and things of that nature. The major piece, which has really been stretching us again, where there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of unity and collaboration is the connectivity piece. Um, they, 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 they move by different rules. Um, and so that is something that we had to go into general fund to really uh, try to make it something sustainable. There's language in the school code that basically says, well, when you're educating a student, the, the school district, you know, you must provide FAPE, free and appropriate public education. And however, you must also provide equal resources for kids. So this technology piece being as though we're in a digital environment, an online environment, it's the school district's responsibility to provide those resources. Now, as I said earlier, this is actually something really good for us to use in the future to supplement uh, strong pedagogy and instruction in the classroom. But one of the major pieces that has been a struggle, um, and this has to do um, not only with dealing with children's issues as adolescents, but also looking at how poverty, poverty and access to health care, uh, healthy foods and nutrition is really being exasperated. So we are trying our best. Um, we're trying our best to, to do the very best with what we have in regards to really paying attention to the SEL components of our students, the social and emotional components. Uh, and, and that is something that is going to have to be sustainable, which it has been, but it's going to have to be on another level. Because as we see now, um, and, and again, looking at the digital divide and looking at the achievement gap data, we're going to have to really, really hit the ground and running um, once that, students are back in face-to-face -face instruction. So those are some of some of the, short, the small highlights. Yeah, Dr. Mumin, can you hear me? Yes, Brian, how you doing? Hey, good to see you. Um, I just want to push you a little bit. I mean, I just think, you know, you're in a district that is the most underfunded, certainly one of the most underfunded in the state. I think for their, my for our readers to kind of understand why this is an issue, it's helpful to hear other things that you just haven't been able to do or couldn't do to the extent that you wanted to. Can you give me one example? Um, is, is it that you couldn't, you know, buy the quality of laptops that you wanted for your students, for example? Just what's something that can help people really, you know, visualize and understand this issue? Yes, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, finicky balance we have to play. By moving the technology devices up to the front 
of our priority list, we have to make sacrifices with professional development in some areas. And as you know, for our, especially students in high poverty areas, the best form of education is face-to-face -face instruction with te technology being used as a supplemental uh, tool. So our teachers, of course, very motivated, uh, extremely, they have the head and heart alignment to do this work. But we had to make some sacrifices in regards to our professional development planning, meaning how robust um, those that those plans were before the pandemic. And that's something we're going to have to catch up with because you, you have to have uh, teachers that are motivated, one, but two, have the tools to be innovative with our with our that's students. Mean, in our can I can I help tease this out a little bit and also ask Superintendent Arcurio to respond? Did you have to take pro uh, professional development, which is teacher training days that were allocated for other basic teacher training and use it for this? And now you're gonna have to find the money to make that up. I think what Miles is really after is what's the trade-offs you had to make? Yes, and, and you hit it right on the nose, Donna. Um, we didn't have to eliminate professional development, but we had to scale back the intensity of the development, meaning the tool itself. So when you find um, tools that promote uh, rigorous pedagogy and instruction, you want to get the full package of tools to have a diverse canon of tools. And looking at, you know, having to cut back and basically take the minimum pieces of those tools and okay. work with what we have, we're going to have to catch up. Superintendent Arcurio, also, uh, Miles, wanted to respond to that question. Sure, thank you. I think for us, you know, we were really um, not able to compete right out the gate when March 13th occurred. My neighboring school districts, you know, were already one-to-one -one districts with access to, to laptops, Chromebooks in students' hands. And we did not have that here at Greater Johnstown. Um, we were not able to hit the ground running and go into full remote learning until we were able to receive that much necessary stimulus package that gave us the funds to be able to purchase those Chromebooks. And so, we purchased those Chromebooks immediately once those funds were allocated to our district. Problem being, everyone else needed Chromebooks at the exact same time. And so the promised delivery date of August became delivery in September, became now it's October, maybe in November. And in Christmas of 2020, we finally got the gift of Chromebooks and the ability to get devices in every student's hands almost nine months after the fact of what happened in a lot of more affluent school districts. They had devices in students' hands immediately. A survey showed our students in our district that about 37% of our families have no connectivity to the internet. So the device is relatively useless if it doesn't connect. And so we work very hard to try and identify hotspots in neighborhoods so that families could connect that didn't have internet in their in their low, in their houses or in their apartments. And one of the things that I want people to understand more than anything is the internet needs to be viewed as as what we what we look as a basic utility in the 20th century. It's no longer a luxury. It's a utility like water and electricity. And we need to ensure in our communities that our families have access. This gives families not only access to education, but it lifts an entire community so that they have access to telehealth. They have access to job applications. They have access to be able to further their education. The internet is so much more than just about education. And it's a lift for an entire community that potentially can bring a community like mine out of poverty. So the digital divide was huge here in the Greater Johnstown School District and just heartbreaking for our students who the students that we continuously recognize need the supports to get further and further ahead that need more resources were well, once again, the students who had little to no resources when this shift changes for changed for all of us in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will say that the interesting thing here, um, as Superintendent Reese, when I went to visit her district, you guys did have one-to-one, -one, right? You've long had 
um, the computer access needed that enabled you to probably, did you guys have to shut down at all during COVID? In March. Uh-huh. March. Um, yeah, we went one-to-one -one in the summer of 2019. So when that happened, we did have devices in all of our students' hands. So that was very nice. Um, we do have a rural broadband initiative that is helping with uh, some of that, you know, connectivity and uh, those type of things. But yeah. Yeah. We, we, had, we shut down in March. We have been opened um, since the beginning of the school year. We shut down two remote weeks after Thanksgiving and a remote week after Christmas. But other than that, we've been in person. I do have a couple of other questions, but um, if the, the other reporters want to get something in. Uh, I don't know uh, whether they do, so go ahead, Miles. Yeah, the first is just um, timing. I mean, this has been an issue. The hold harmless funding and equity has been an issue for years, you know. And the Inquirer, I know, published a piece back in October um, about a report submitted to a, a judge presiding over this case as it moves through the state's legal system that that, that named that $4.6 billion number saying that this is how much money we need to put in to fix the system. So a question for you, Donna, and for you folks with PCCY is, what's new in this report, if anything, and, and why now? Mm. So I think there's two things about what the report shows. I have yet to find, you know, I've been working on education policy for 25 years, and I was really looking for myself to get a handle on how many students the Commonwealth's current funding system is paying for that are not attending the schools in which we're paying them for. So to get a handle on the uh, $590 million figure of the amount of money going through Hold Harmless that we are paying for 167,000 children who are no longer attending their school districts and finding that in fact among the Hold Harmless districts there is extreme uh, needs uh, that they have, yes, had the benefit of state largesse, but even that largesse has not been sufficient in many cases, like in Greater Johnstown, to enable them to both have a reasonable tax effort and enable them to uh, offer quality education. You heard they had to wait till December 2020 to get yeah. their funders. So okay. what's new here is being able to really put your arms around what the hold harmless actually means and put your arms around the fact that it as a punching bag is too superficial an argument. And so fundamentally, we need to get a little bit more sophisticated about our analysis, shift from the fight over the hold harmless to a fight about an adequacy target and a supplement. Uh, while I would be hopeful that the court would say to the legislature, come up with $4.6 billion, they don't have to wait for the court to act. And what we're offering today is enough context that we believe should motivate lawmakers to put a supplement in place with adequacy targets so we can start to remedy the heartache that we are seeing from these champions of their communities. Um, and, that, and that brings me to my, the last question I had, which is, can you, can you sort of explain again what this supplement looks like if it's not the $4.6 billion that's been named as what would fix the whole system? If, if the goal isn't to blow up hold harmless, and the goal isn't, and it sort of seems not feasible to find another $4.6 billion per year in education funding. What is feasible? What, what exactly are you looking to do with this uh, adequacy target? What, where would the money come from? How much new money would have to come into the system? Yeah, so thank you so much for that question. And I will say that um, our analysis together with that of partners has looked at the fact that there are about a hundred districts that have the um, highest share of students in poverty and the lowest amount of total ability to spend between their local tax effort and the state effort uh, and federal funds, which as you know, is not that much. And so instead of putting 4.6 billion across 500 districts, which just to put that in context for people who are listening, the state currently spends 6.6 .6 billion um, to fund public schools. So they would have to increase nearly by 80% the funding to uh, achieve what the school funding formula says based on the science and math is needed for every school district to get what they need. And what we're saying is that in short order, that is probably not gonna happen, certainly not in the case of the current COVID crisis, but it should not stop action to remedy the people who are furthest from what they need. And so if you take the 100 districts, 
that have the highest concentration of children who are low income, children who have special needs, and you then rank them against how much total amount they have to spend, you find that you can really easily create a group of school districts, 20% of the school districts, where if you infused an extra 100, $200 million a year on top of whatever the state's gonna do for the basic ed funding formula, you can begin to quickly bring them up. Now that's, an, that's one approach. Another approach is you do an adequacy study as was done in 2006, or you just simply update that. And you say, look, any district spending less than $12,000 for a regular kid, uh, $13,000 for a poor kid, $18,000, and I'm being generous in these numbers, I'm not suggesting they are the accurate numbers, for an English language learner kid, any school district not hitting those adequacy targets would be the first recipients of all new state aid. That's another approach that shrinks the expectations and the need of the taxpayers to remedy this situation and targets the money where we have children attending school, children who are low income and communities that have a high tax effort and the communities themselves, whether it's Greater Johnstown or Reading, cannot of their local effort generate enough money yeah. to support their kids. Okay, so you're calling on legislators then to, to either find an extra couple of hundred million dollars, which seems more feasible to target towards the highest need districts. On a recurring basis, right? Yes. You can do yeah. it once, yes. And it's well, just the way, again, you know, the lawsuit might mandate $4.6 billion remedy, which would require the state to have to think about making other priorities in the budget and or new revenues. But we do think that there's plenty of room in a recurring way within the framework of state revenues to make much more progress in addressing the common cause of school districts, educating the poorest children in our state. Got it, thank you. I want to point out that on Facebook Live right now, uh, Laura Johnson is a Pottstown school board member. And she said, like uh, Greater Johnstown and perhaps in Reading, it took them very long to get up online because they didn't have the technology built into their budget because they couldn't afford to do so. Um, now, again, federal funds and state funds have remedied this temporarily, um, but Pottstown and Greater Johnstown and Reading are going to have to make cuts to support those costs going forward um, when, if we had a reasonable school funding system, they would be the very districts that a supplement and an adequacy target would ensure get the resources they need. Um, so I just wanna say, uh, there are a couple other reporters on, uh, if anybody else has a question. I wanna um, thank the superintendents who were here today and members of the press for those listening on Facebook Live, please go to our website at pccy.org, check out the report. Um, we encourage citizens of the Commonwealth to take action all the time. And so we have a school board resolution and letters to lawmakers that we'll be rolling out over the next couple of weeks to really hit home, uh, changing the conversation, uniting the cause of the Hold Harmless and the growing districts so that we can work together to solve the needs of the students. Thank you very much for being with us today.